Um, so I want to just kind of maybe start with some questions. Um, and I'll maybe just like say some terms and then maybe just like raise your hand if they're familiar. Uh, common JS. For those who aren't familiar, Common JS is the module loading uh, algorithm and implementation that Node uses right now. Uh, ECMAScript modules. So ECMAScript modules is the version of module loading that's specified in ECMAScript 5. Um, I, I say like specified in a weird way because parts of it are specified and parts aren't. Like the loader itself is not fully specified and that's what makes things kind of complicated. Um, transparent interoperability. So transparent interoperability is a word that we deprecated, but I refuse to stop using um, because it's confusing. But when, when I say it, I'm specifically referring to being able to require an ESM module or import a common JS module and not have to know, you know, what the format is that it exposes. Um, we currently, for example, in our implementation, have transparent interoperability, but only to import common JS and only the default object. You can't get named exports. Um, you just start to see how this gets really edge casey. Um, so let me plug in and get started here. I figured what would be like a good way to start before we kind of jump into discussion is just like a quick history. You know, I'll save you all like the longer, fuller slide deck. Uh, you can watch me not get my password right a couple times. It's very much like it is day to day for me. Um, it's not long. Maybe. Cool, so it, right here what you can see is a markdown file that you can find in the Node.js modules. The Zoom. Um, for those who set up the Zoom, oh, I don't know about this. Oh, that is great. You can't even see what I'm doing. For those of you who are wondering what that is, that's a corner of a really beautiful water color painting of Calvin and Hobbes. So you didn't even get the exciting part of the water color. Um, let, me, let me fix this. I've been talking as if you could see my screen. Um, so to just, I guess, set um, the tone. Just stop me if I'm not making sense. <laughs> um, well, this is what I was humming and hawing about. Yeah. Except in the terms of service. Um, uh, one second, folks, if you need a second mic for talking, because there are people like streaming and stuff, I leave this at this table. So we, we avoid the situation where I need to run <laughs> as before. Make sure I close all the things. Okay, cool. Um, sharing my screen, Mateo, is that good? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So um, I'm going to get started by going through this document and a little bit of history. So is there a way to hide this? Maybe you put all the way on the top. This is no, I don't oh, move to bot. No. Okay. Cool. I, I did that on purpose because I believe that that is set up with audio to the mic, you know, so. Yeah. Okay, whatever. Um, so a little bit over a year ago, maybe even closer to two at this point, I don't know dates, but we released ESM in Node. Um, we did an initial implementation that landed behind a flag. I believe that was in a version of Node 7. I don't know. Um, but so it, it landed and people were not super thrilled with some of the implementation details. Um, some of the stickier points, for example, were the requirement of the .mjs extension for ES modules. Um, 
but you know there are there are a number of different critiques um, in response to this um, and this is actually kind of a cool thing if you're not familiar with it in general uh, the TSC keeps we started doing um, this thing called strategic initiatives um, if you look at the history we can see how old these are um, this is something that's talked about but kind of was kicked off by Mike Dawson in October of 2017 and the strategic initiatives are things that we've identified that are like really, really important, high level um, things that we should be focused on as a technical steering committee, as a project. Um, it was a bit of a shift that we made then around the TSC being much uh, more forward thinking uh, than being responsive. So a lot of things that TSC was focused on beforehand was like, oh, there's a fire, we've got to put it out. And we wanted to have a shift um, to be much more forward thinking and thinking of the future and kind of, um, dealing with existential threats to, to know itself. Um, and so you can see one of the first ones on there was modules. Um, and I was the champion of it. We should actually probably update those links, but there's this original like EPS that's from 2017. This kind of was how the initial implementation was like spec'd out and then implemented. As I mentioned, it was not extremely well received. Uh, I myself was glad that we had something as a starting point, but um, people couldn't agree on this stuff. So what we did is we spun up this modules team. Um, after about six months of just like yelling and bike shedding, we came up with a plan. Um, and the plan was this idea that we called uh, the minimal kernel. Um, oh, so node 8.5 is, is where it landed. Great. Um, so the idea that the modules team did is we kind of uh, permutated a whole bunch of use cases as well as different um, different needs that we had from the module loader. So if you actually go here and go into the issues here and look at one of the 213 closed issues, um, you can see lots of different issues that were opened up for like, you know, well, early ones around the governance, but later ones around stuff like, you know, import maps, proposal for bare imports, um, upstream changes to node. If you go into the modules repo itself, um, we have a list of these different features um, that was based on number 55, which was the collection of kind of tracking all of those. And so we have all these different use cases that we identified that we would need, although it was also kind of identified early that, hey, some of these use cases don't, aren't able to coexist. So we can want everything, but we're gonna kind of have to figure out what works and what doesn't. So what we came up with was this plan um, with different phases. So phase zero is what branching off of the current node implementation. Um, phase one was this concept of a minimal kernel. So what we did is we just stripped back features from the current implementation until we had a baseline, um, and that baseline was not really usable. Um, but that baseline was, hey, what are the common features that all the potential future iterations that we're talking about and all of the use cases that we'd like to see happen um, are possible with. So what, are, what is a baseline that if we were all to go and fork node right now and try to make our perfect implementation of modules, we could all fork from the exact same point and at least build upon the same shared idea. Um, and then phase two was fleshing out that implementation with enough functionality that could actually be useful. So the phase one minimal kernel was like absolutely useless. Let's make it kind of useful. And we shipped phase two with node 12. Um, and now we're in phase three, which is extending that MVP with uh, better user experience and edge cases that we've found. Um, and that's kind of where we are right now. And through, throughout that, the entire phase, one of the things that we came up with as a group was these kind of like goals and guidelines and vision that everyone agreed to, even if we couldn't agree about, you know, like specifier resolution or transparent interop. We could agree that we wanted um, our implementation to be spec compliant. We wanted as much for it to be browser equivalent. So we wanted uh, the loader in node to as much as possible match either the browser or the direction of what the browser's capabilities may be in the near future. Um, and we also wanted to not do anything that broke common JS. So any of the changes that we were um, planning to do couldn't just you know, go under the hood and completely break our currently existing ecosystem. 
So um, with phase zero starting from the current shipping node, the following changes were made to strip out most of the 8.5.0 experimental modules. So the first thing we did is remove support in the import statement for common JS, uh, JSON and native modules. So that was all of the like, transparent interop that existed. Um, we also removed dynamic path searching, so that meant um, no automatic adding of extensions, um, no directory resolution support, so support for like slash index and slash index.js, just being able to import a directory, and no support even for the main fields. So there, was, there wasn't really even support for bare imports. Uh, bare imports being when you just give um, a specifier, um, that is some math, um, and a specifier would be something like, you know, require a lodash. That's an example of a bare specifier. And in the package JSON, you're able to use um, the main field to specify like what that resolves to. Um, but we even stripped that out from this kind of phase zero. Um, we completely removed the VM module implementation, we also completely removed the loader implementation. Um, and these changes were implemented in this pull request uh, over here. We don't need to wait for it to load. Um, the next phase that we did, which was, was called the minimal kernel, was introducing a few more features into the implementation that were necessary to just kind of like, they were the baseline features that everyone agreed on, so that included module create required from path, uh, a now deprecated API because it turns out it's really annoying to use. Um, and we talked about things like import meta require or having the import statements have transparent interop. Um, but we decided that none of that would be in the middle of the kernel because we didn't have uh, consensus around it. And each of those features actually would negate other potential features that people were thinking about. Um, we made import statements only support the .mjs extension. The idea being here that we were planning as a group that we would always support .js. So even if we found a way to have .js files as ESM, there will always be a need for completely unambiguous file extensions. Um, so we kept support for import of ESM, but only for MJS files. Uh, we included import.meta.url. This is something that exists in the browser as well. It just gives you a file URL to the file that you're in. Um, we kept dynamic import. That was another feature that we had pretty much large consensus. This will always work. Um, and we did still allow for support for built-in modules with named exports. Um, so that would be something like, um, what it would be like import um, ref, uh, if I could spell. So stuff like this continued to work. We all agreed, hey, we're never going to change that implementation. We're always going to want to be able to import the built-in libraries. We're always going to want named exports. Um, built-in libraries, the, like the built-in libraries in Node, even though they're implemented in CommonJS, is all known to us at compile time. So we can do some fancy stuff with our built-ins that can't be done with ecosystem modules. But we pretty much had consensus that any implementation moving forward will have that feature. And so um, the combination of all of those made the minimal kernel. Uh, if you're wondering timeline here, this is probably about like 15 months into discussion that we managed to get there. Um, but it, what ended up being really amazing was like by the time we came to this decision, by actually just stripping things away instead of trying to add things and having that, that shared understanding of the space, it just unlocked a whole bunch of stuff because now we weren't, we at least had a fundamental place that we were all on the same page about. So the next bit was phase two and there was a lot of debate to kind of pick the features that went into phase two and actually a lot of research to land on them. Um, but what eventually landed into phase two was, a, one was defining the semantics for importing a package entry point. So that's like, you know, the main field. And um, there was a file specifier resolution um, proposal um, that is referenced here and the pull request that landed in. Um, and so this kind of went through how that would be implemented, how this would be resolved, and how that would work. Um, yeah, sure. Oh, sorry. I just want to hear from you. Yeah, sorry. It's not a question about this. 
And if people want to go to the other session, maybe I thought I would announce it because I'm leaving now and maybe other people would. Oh, yeah, absolutely. At 10 o'clock. So if you want to go to the MDM session, a few of us are leaving now to that. Thank you. And, and please, in general, if you want to walk out for the bathroom, personal grievances, other session, please. Um, I'm boring. I don't want to. Um, no, but seriously, like if you need to go to the other session, no big deal. Um, so we define the semantics for package entry points. We define the semantics for determining when to load resources as either common JS or JS modules. Um, this was the introdu introduction of um, the type field in the package JSON. So you can now do type module, and if you do type module in the package JSON, .js now resolves to ESM instead of CJS. Um, and it did involve the creation of a new .cjs extension, which I'm pretty excited about. So like I actually now, for me, um, we've got three extensions, and this is like obviously CJS. Um, let's see if this works. Wait, no. um, I have like a shorthand to expand to the shruggy, so just assume that that means shruggy. Um, and that's ESM. So I'm not saying to do this in your code today, but like this is actually a way in which you could organize your code. That would like always work in pretty much all environments, uh, but that was a big part of it because if we had importing of .js allowed and .js is always ESM, well, how do you still import any common JS files? Um, the other thing is like these semantics are all bound to the package scope. So if you make a folder and that folder has a package JSON. Um, that will define the semantics from that folder down in the folder hierarchy. So you can kind of have JS files throughout your project, and as long as there's a package JSON near it, it will use the nearest package JSON to resolve what type of uh, file it is. And this is really great because it's purely static. So you know, build tools or any sort of tool can crawl uh, the file source of uh, a project and and a whole bunch of nested projects. And this is deterministic and static, so it's pretty consistent. It's very different than, for example, if we did something like, hey, if you have a .js and it could be either ESM or CJS, and we do some sort of like pre-parse of the AST and then determine the type and then load it, that would have been completely dynamic. And then there would be no way to like statically determine that without actually parsing all of the files. So I don't know. I prefer this. Just me. Um, we define this semantics for enabling ESM treatment of source code for a val. Um, that was the entry types proposal. Um, it was originally, you can see we renamed it a couple times. That was actually, amazingly, one of the only byte sheds that we had when we made the upstream PR was the name of this one feature and its functionality. Um, the other thing that we also did, and this is something I'd actually love to talk to the room a little bit more in a minute was we disabled file extension and directory searching by default. You can turn it back on uh, with this flag. But what that means is that um, you can't uh, like import dot slash folder slash thing. Um, you need to include the file extension to do it. And if you don't include the file extension, um, it better not have a file extension or we're not going to find it. Um, a big motivating factor for this was browser equivalents. Um, there are things like import maps that are going to allow for some fancy stuff, um, but generally browsers are not going to like hit the server three or four times to determine the file extension of a resource. And so by introducing this constraint into our loader, um, we're, in my personal opinion, significantly improving the possibility that, um, that we have equivalents. Um, another thing that landed in phase two that's not in here was experimental JSON modules, which excitingly enough, I think Dan Ehrenberg is somewhere in here. Um, he went over. Oh, he went over. Well, uh, Dan did the uh, work with some people on spec text, and JSON modules actually landed in the HTML spec just a couple weeks ago and has uh, vendor interest from every major browser to implement. And we have now in Node's experimental loader um, a spec compliant JSON loader with the first uh, implementation of it, which I'm pretty excited about. Um, so we're in phase three right now, and that's kind of removing the experimental modules flag. And there's a handful of things that we need to figure out to move forward. And you know, kind of after reading this, will be in a really great place to start a conversation. 
Um, so the first is a loader solution that supports all the items in the features list. So there's a, like custom loaders, the ability to say, hey, when you import a file, like run this dynamic code first instead of just loading it. Um, that is something that we need to figure out. We have an implementation of loaders that currently exists. The team is not super happy with it. We have the beginning of a new implementation. It has all sorts of memory leaks. And it's also built on top of um, the worker threads um, implementation that still needs some kind of tweaks to be ergon ergonomic together. Um, so if you're looking for somewhere to work and you have some really great C++ drops, that's somewhere where you can come in and help us today. We need to map the paths with the in modules providing uh, similar functionality as the browser's import map. So we have a package exports proposal. Uh, Jan over here, Jan, you raise your hand really quickly. Um, Jan has come up with a lot of those ideas. Package exports, I, I think, is really, really cool. It's the idea and name pending that you would make like an exports field. And in the exports field here, you could say like, uh, you know, like uh, deep import and um, specify, you know, like file path.mjs. And now you'd be able to like import. Um, Like this without any file extensions and you could specify the specific deep imports part of the idea that we have here that i'm pretty excited about would be actually locking down and not allowing just deep traversal inside of the module itself it is possible that you could just do something like this the semantics are still up in the air that would allow like kind of infinite deep searching um, but the plan would be twofold one to kind of make more of a public and private declared definition for modules so you could be really clear about what interface you're exposing to users. Um, as a module author myself, I have definitely been surprised when I find out like that people are going in and like randomly importing or requiring a specific utility function that I did not design as a public facing API. And now you're supporting it because if you break it, you're breaking the people who are depending on you. Um, export maps would make it far easier to define that interface. The other thing that would be really cool, uh, import maps is a browser um, spec that's I think in an origin trial right now, but it could be mistaken. Um, but import maps are what are going to allow this kind of like bare imports to exist in the browser and to like turn that module into like node, mo node modules slash module slash path to entry point. Um, the same thing that we have with package JSON and main. Import maps are going to be like a static file that's at the top level of your application. It's loaded, um, I believe, as like a source tag or something. I'd have to relook at the spec. But what would be really cool with this exports is a tool could statically crawl in while installing your module graph, like actually specify all of those deep imports. So when we're talking about browser equivalents, if you're being explicit about this, um, tools would then be able to statically generate all of this and we'd be able to have the exact same kind of import um, interface for both the browser and node. Um, so this is a proposal that I think Guy Bedford, who might also be in the room. Guy, are you around? Guy's over there. I think Guy has an implementation of this somewhere, um, but it's something that we definitely want some more feedback on. Uh, we also are interested in having this be part of common JS as well. So we need to figure out, hey, like, is this something that people would use, or are there things that we would break that we're not aware of? Um, that's something I would love to bring to the audience as something that we can talk about. Um, there's a proposal that's still being debated whether or not we want to do it, which is like having some sort of reference inside of the package to reference itself. So you could import. Um, I mean, like, here's some like really naive syntax. I don't think that this would be it. But if we had namespaces in Node, we can have like um, something like self or this or me or like some sort of specifier there. Um, that means your own module because there's a lot of places where you may import from your own modules, and then you have like deep paths and dot dots and whatnot, and it's not great. It's like a bit of a refactoring hazard, potentially. So that's one thing that we're exploring. Uh, this is another one that came up as a potential inconsistency from CommonJS and ESM, and that's a debate within the modules group as well. Like, should we be introducing new features like this 
to ESM if we're not able to have the same capabilities in CommonJS? Would implementing something like this in CommonJS even be possible or would it be breaking? I think, but I'm not 100%, as we explore namespaces as a possible thing, that opens up the design space, but doing it right now without namespaces I don't think would be possible with a separate major. But yeah, love to hear what you think about that. Um, limited module type declaration. Um, I'm not sure what that one is. That's oh, that's the utility method um, for determining the type of a module. There's an upstream PR for this right now. So if you have feelings, you can jump into this. This is like util methods that you can run on source text, and it can tell you if it is ESM. Um, I think that there's yeah, it's like contain module syntax is the current API. It kind of looks like this. I think there's some debates about whether or not this is the best API, what the API should look like. Um, that's part of phase three. Um, another one is provide a way to make ESM the default in Node instead of common JS. So how do we move so that just like using the Node binary expects ESM instead of common? Um, dual mode modules is a really contentious topic right now. So the ability to have a module that you can import that can be either common JS or ESM. So you can both require it and import it um, with the same specifier. So like this is important for module authors. If you are a module author and you want people to be able to like both import Lodash and require Lodash um, and just kind of have that work, that's what we would call dual mode. I have some of my own opinions. I, I don't think it should exist, but I won't dig into it because I don't want to poison you with my bias too early in this discussion. Um, but that's something that we are actively debating about like, hey, how, how should this work? Um, should it even work? Uh, the current implementation that we have with only the single entry point main that's shared between CommonJS and ESM, and with the file extension turned off, it's actually not possible anymore. I think that's a feature people disagree. Um, so that's something that we're debating. And we also need to finalize the behavior of importing CommonJS. So we want to be able to import CommonJS and, and have named exports, but right now we can only do a default export that has something to do with the specification and being spec compliant. You can't have, um, it's just not possible. We, we can dig into that more afterwards. Uh, we've tried to go to TC39 a couple times with different approaches to how we can allow for dynamic modules where like it exports the names of things and resolves those later. Um, but we've been unable to do that in a way that can get consensus at the committee. So there was debate about whether or not we should, even should have that transparent interop if it's default only, because you still even need to know that it's a common JS module anyways. That's a debate. Um, one of the things that done, is done, the only thing that we actually finished right now is we uh, made a better mechanism for require with create require. So you can now do um, import um, create require from module and then uh, create require import meta URL. And then that literally gives you a require inside of the module that you can use. Um, this little bit of uh, ritual is not the best user experience, but we haven't come up with a better way to do it. Um, having something available immediately on import meta require is something that we discussed, but the problem is that it doesn't fail early, if that doesn't exist. So if you take some code that's been written in Node that is import meta require and you bundle it into a browser module and then they're using require dynamically somewhere deep in like an if statement, um, that's gonna blow up in really weird and unexpected ways, which is one of the reasons why we didn't want to introduce that API, although that API would be like a million times better from the user experience standpoint. Um, and that kind of sums things up, and I think that that last example I talked about is the perfect example of the struggles that we've had this whole time, which is finding the balance between like foot guns, salgo, and user experience. Um, I guess with that, um, thank you for letting me talk at you for like 30 minutes, and I open it to the floor for questions and discussion. Hey, Miles. Um, I'm not sure if you can guess what I will ask, but uh, has there been any, could you talk a little bit about how uh, we as APM vendors can look into the import uh, features? Uh, to get notified when things are imported and possibly modify things on the fly. Yes, so, so that would be the loaders. 
that, that I was talking about uh, earlier. So right now, I think um, we look here. This is Dash. It's like the best thing ever. If you haven't had it installed on your computer, you should do it. There are open source versions available for Linux and Windows as well, but it's just an offline document version uh, viewer with really great fuzzy search. So this is the experimental loader hooks that exist right now. And so you can make a result hook right now, which changes what's resolved. But to your point, that doesn't really change. Like if we think about module loading, there's a couple different phases. So there's kind of like um, fetch, resolve, and transform. And so like, um, it's in this order. So like resolve is what takes like a specifier and turns it into a path. So that's what would turn like Lodash into uh, node modules. It would be like file, like in the whole path to, to node modules. Um, fetch is what can then take um, a path and turn it into like the actual source text. And it's a little more complicated under the hood. This is all happening with like source text module records like under the hood, but this is kind of the high level. And then the transform is what can, you know, like take that source text and then turn that into like the actual object that is then inside of um, inside of the cache. So each of these phases are kind of like different phases that you may want to hook into. So um, you know this specifier to file path, for example, um, with just a hook there, you can implement uh, the file extension resolution algorithm. Uh, but you don't need to hook into any of these other things um, for fetching the source text. That's how, as an APM vendor, for example, you could fetch your own custom implementation of, F of F FS instead of our implementation of FS. Uh, for transform source text, you know, combined with resolve specifier, that's how we could implement like built-in TypeScript support by like transforming that source text before actually executing it. So the newer version of oh, Jan? Um, just because I just uh, thought of it, but since you're talking about FS, most likely you should help. That's a very good point. Um, just because I'm just thinking of it, uh, what you just described would most likely not work in an APM point in the vendor, for example, wanted to influence the implementation of HTTP.create server because it would be a named export on a core module and most likely they would not be able to modify the core module source text or would they also be able to do that? I think that Guy may have more inside into the loaders right now, but I may be wrong. Um, I believe that we would allow for intercepting of any modules that are being fetched. Sure, so if it's a core module like HTTP, what we've done right now in supporting named exports on core modules is we've set those up as live bindings. Um, so if you, if you have the common JS version of HTTP and you have a write create server, um, that's gonna update in the ES module live binding as well because it's a proxy. So uh, we've got that in core, but for third-party modules, yes, APM on the named exports is tricky because you actually need to inject into that source code and update those, those ES module live bindings with all the exports, like the, if you've got export let or export function, you actually want to be updating that export and you can only do that from within the module, you can't do it from outside of the module, so that will be an APM function. One thing that I've been thinking about, this is by no means even close to solution. We were playing around, I actually didn't mention this in here at all, was WebAssembly modules. So we shipped an experimental WebAssembly module implementation uh, last week or two weeks ago. I don't know. Um, but it, it landed and I started playing with building stuff with scripting. And one of the first things that I noticed was like, when we built it out and we did the tests for it, we didn't actually like compile WebAssembly with scripting. We took what's known as um, WAVM. What is it? Um, there's an intermediate representation of the AST, so WAST, and we we directly compiled WAST to WASM so that it was like a pretty pretty clean uh, translation. And all of our tests and everything that we've implemented works with WAST to WASM. But almost no one is like writing WAST by hand. Um, most people are taking like C code and then compiling that to WebAssembly. And if you use Inscripten, Inscripten is embedding 
its own uh, sysroot, and that includes like a whole implementation of just things like how do we convert printf or any sort of the system calls that exist into things that are actually happening. Inscripting does that right now by actually like wrapping all the code in like thousands of lines of JavaScript that's expecting to execute and have available. And then it's expecting there to be like this source object um, that's available that just has specific things implemented in it. There's no way for us today to like inject on a per module scope like things to say, hey, if you try to import source in only this module, it will resolve to this thing. Now this is actually a thing that import maps are introducing, so that's something that we could think about exploring. But one of the things um, that may help with APMs, but I'm not 100%, would be some sort of support for a kind of a, like injecting or changing the scope of what happens when you import specific modules from the context of one module. So if we try to, from inside of a WebAssembly module, import something called source, and it doesn't exist anywhere else, can we inject like a particular thing for that namespace? I don't know if this is possible, and I don't know if there's a way for us to do that with spec compliance, but because of like this edge case that I've seen with WebAssembly, it's something that I'm, that I'm thinking about. And that would be kind of similar, I guess, in a way to ProxyWire, but not exactly. It would be a bit of a different thing. Do we have anybody in the modules working group right now uh, representing APM vendors? There are people who are definitely thinking of those use cases. As I had mentioned with the loaders, we need more people who are coming and working on it. Um, I believe that we had initially wanted that to be kind of a blocking thing to removing the flag, but as we get closer to like October and as the rest of the implementation gets more stable, we are actually getting closer to making a decision to just keep loaders behind an additional flag and potentially unflag without these capabilities. And I understand where that would be really detrimental to APMs. So we should likely sync on that and see about how we can get the right people focusing on that problem. Um, any other questions? Um, yeah, so uh, there, there's a lot here, I think, for module authors to absorb. Um, <laughs> And will you, in addition to actually doing all the great implementation, will you be publishing any kind of recommendations or documentation for module authors to understand what, uh, what they need to do in order to support the most um, versions of Node as possible? Because it sounds like at some point there's going to be things that are, uh, I guess, maybe mutually exclusive you can't support. Um, yeah, so, so the question to repeat for the people on the stream is how are we going to do things to make it um, Ergonomic for module authors to support multiple versions of Node. Is that an accurate? Yeah. So uh, that is like kind of what's actively being debated with dual mode modules. And so um, dual mode modules would be something like if we had like what I would consider a really nice solution would be having a module field um, like this, and then having a separate yeah, main. Yeah. That, that would be yeah, like a really nice solution to the problem space. Um, we're just doing this we're doing okay. for things like Babel. And I think that there's a couple of mechanisms for defining like multiple entry points depending on the runtime. One of the things that I'm primarily concerned about is that. This does not mean the same thing in Node that it means to Babel and Webpack. It means multiple entry points, but generally when you're using Babel and Webpack, it's multiple entry points at time, not multiple entry points at one time. So this is a huge hazard, in my personal opinion, um, for module authors that are running code in Node, because what it would then mean would be like the specifier for my module would mean two different things depending on the loader that you're in and would potentially like create like weird cache duplication. So like the common JS cache and the ESM cache are two separate caches. And so when you import a common JS module today with the way that interop works, what we do is we instantiate, we, we get the source text, we instantiate it, we create it. We create a reference to it in the common JS cache and then we create a pointer and reference to it in the ESM cache with both of them pointing to the same single thing. Um, 
where, where this gets like really weird would be like the common JS cache has no reference to the ESM cache. So if you're in a module graph that started as ESM and you imported a module, you would instantiate this source text. You can create that record inside of the ESM cache. And then if later on down in your tree, someone required the exact same module in the exact same like general module context, so not just like deep where it's a different thing, it would actually create a new instance inside of the require cache with a completely different singleton. And in many cases, this may just kind of work, but having worked on things that are expecting behavior in that singleton or shared state um, between your app, that just creates these like really, really weird errors, these really weird, hard to track down and hard to even know what's going on problems in the tree that sometimes don't even manifest until production and sometimes not even until like, you know, two weeks in production. So, so uh, I mean, it obviously sounds kind of tricky. Um, <laughs> uh, what, like, do you think that the, the real recommendation would be for module authors to sort of cut over to ESM at some point and only support it, you know, going forward on say Node 12 or whatever, ESM modules, but prior to that, it's all CJS, or like, how would that work? So we're still debating that. And if you have opinions and interests on that, like one of the things I've been challenging people to think about is like, come up with a user journey. Come up with a user journey of like, I am a module author who needs to, who wants to upgrade my module to be ESM, and what's that transition path? And so I'll show you an example of one that I've created. I'm a module author. I have this module called Node OSC. Node OSC is a library for doing open sound control, primarily used by like artists and musicians. So not people who necessarily have a, re a really deep understanding of our ecosystem and all the subtleties that I've been talking about for the last 40 minutes. Um, here's an example of, no of new experimental ESM implementation, where all I've done is I've created a deep entry point called ESM.mjs. This can land in a sender minor. You can see that all that ESM.mjs is doing it's actually just importing all of the common JS um, things and then exporting them as a default, but also exporting them as named exports. So this creates an ESM like interface into the common JS that will work, will have named exports. Um, if we had the export map proposal that I'm talking about, we'd be able to drop the .mjs from it. Then what I have is this branch called next where I'm in the process of slowly um, converting everything over to ESM completely. Um, it hasn't happened yet, but the idea would be that we would have legacy CJS support at Node.js slash CJS. And in Assembler Minor on the prior Assembler Major, you could still introduce that slash CJS entry point as the same as the main. And so this isn't perfect. It's definitely not as ergonomic as just having a shared main. But I actually think that this is pretty reasonable. It creates like explicit entry points. If you're supporting it, slash CJS and slash ESM could always work as explicit entry points. And you could basically flip which one is the default in a separate major. Um, this is, we've documented this recently in a pull request. Um, I think um, Jeff over in the chat um, has pointed to it right here. Um, and this is like our current recommendation and that kind of documents the pattern that I was just talking about. Um, we're open to other patterns and other user journeys. So, you know, the more people who can put brain power on this problem and think through it, we're open to kind of talk through it and try to figure it out. I, I recognize that this is one of the biggest problems that we will have as an ecosystem. And we get pretty fired up in our meetings when we talk about what the defaults on this should be. Um, because we know that it's A, extremely important for the adoption of ESM, but also B, really important for module authors who are gonna have to do this um, to continue to support all of the different people who are gonna use their modules. Thanks. Um, I think, Joy, did you have your hand up? And uh, to the people who are dialing in on the stream, I've now got your comments on the screen. Um, I'm sorry we don't have you connected to the mic. But if you have particular questions as well, please feel free to put them in the chat and I will try and take it to you. Uh, Joy? Um, is the plan to get the ESM implementation out of experiment, experiment as soon as you drop the flag? Or is there any plan to like, keep it experimental while the flag is dropped? 
That's a really good question. To be honest, we haven't discussed the possibility of removing the flag but still keeping it experimental. I know that we've done that for some other implementations. I think, like my gut on it is that like people want ESM so badly that the moment that we remove it, the flag, a lot of people are going to just start adopting it. So I don't know. It might be good to even keep it experimental, like remove the flag before LTS and maybe try to remove the experimental flag in December minor, or remove the experimental status at some point. I think, James, is that what we did with HTTP2? Remove the flag and then upgrade it later. So that's definitely an option that we hadn't really discussed. Another thing that we definitely want to try to do is backport to 10 if possible. Um, but we're kind of we're waiting to see where things land before we see what we can backport to 10. It may also just be possible to backport to 10, like the basic capabilities, but just a different implementation, but a lot of the same behaviors. Um, but we're waiting until we remove the flag before even starting to tackle that. Thank you. Uh, Michael Dawson? Just wondering about importing native modules. If you guys work through that. Yeah, so native modules, there's kind of two different things that are going on. And I can actually, um, let's see. I'll show you some code. Um, so it's not. Uh, Guy, what's the one where we resolve the specifiers? It's not translators. It's Like, I'm trying to remember the name of the, oh, default resolve, there we go. <laughs> so um, this is how we're actually doing the file extension resolution itself. And you can see that we have two different format maps. So we have um, the extension format map and a legacy extension format map. And so basically, when you're in the legacy mode, which is essentially when you don't have type module or you have type legacy inside of your package JSON, um, this is what the file extensions will resolve to. So CJS and .js resolve to the common JS translator, um, and that's in translators.js. This is actually the implementation of those different loaders. So there's the WASM loader, there's the JSON loader, there's the built-in loader. Um, this is the common JS loader, and that's the main load, module loader. It's actually surprisingly not a lot of code. Um, but so when you're in the legacy mode, these are what the extensions map to, and you'll see dot node maps to common JS. When you do mode, um, when you do type module, we actually don't support anything out of the box right now that is not like browser equivalent. So we don't support native modules, um, but that's only within the boundary of your own package. So if you import a package that's a native module, it will still resolve and work. The only uh, limitation is the same limitations of common JS. You won't get named exports. You'll only be able to import the default namespace. Um, if you want something that feels a little bit more like named exports, you can use create require to create a require function and then require it and do structure the require, or you can destructure the default export. It's not the most ergonomic, but it's the only way that we can do it right now with spec compliant. Um, one of the things that we do have, though, is um, the WASM stuff, I'm confused that I'm not seeing dot WASM in our extension map. I'll look into that afterwards. Um, but essentially, we're, we, are, we are actively exploring WebAssembly and specifically WASI. And I think there's some members of the Mozilla team that works on WebAssembly in the room. We've got Till back there. Um, the WebAssembly WASI stuff is a uh, system interface. We're, we're actively exploring the WebAssembly system interface as being kind of the next generation native modules um, as an alternative uh, approach and being one that like could potentially have browser equivalents. Um, but you know, these are still up in the air. Um, we could choose to change the way that this is supported, but I think in general, like you wouldn't be writing an ESM module that's using the legacy native module system. So as long as you had a package JSON that doesn't have type module in it in your module that's a native module, anyone can import it. They just can't do named exports. So there's support there, but it's limited support. Um, we are at 1031, which I think is break time. 
Um, do people want to have any more questions or should we call it and have some coffee and orange juice and say hi to all our friends? Okay, cool. Um, here's a large hand pack. Thank you, everyone. Good job. Good job, Miles. Uh, just remember that if you want to keep discussing Minecraft, you might grab one of those. Oh, actually, um, really quickly before we go, hey, people on the chat, do you have any questions before we disconnect? Five, four, three. Um, will there be modules after the break? Uh, Jeffrey, there's a session later on modules and security, um, but not like just general modules. Any more questions? Okay, be free. <laughs>